The Soybean School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Pride Seeds, Preaxer Zemium Fungicide, and Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to the Soybean School. Um, it's our final episode of the year. And today we're going to look back at 2021. Um, certainly uh, a growing year that had a cheer of ups and downs. Uh, and to talk about uh, where we landed and what we learned. I'm uh, joined by uh, Horst Bonner, Omafra's soybean specialist. Hi, Horst. How's it going? I'm doing all right, Bernard. Yes, great to see you. Hey, I want to uh, dissect the season um, and also look at some of the research you conducted uh, this year. But first, let's talk about yield. Um, All the conversations this fall were about that incredible corn crop in Ontario. uh, But now you're reporting a record yield for soybeans. That's 51.6 bushels per acre. Um, Are you surprised by that? Well, we we were expecting a pretty big crop. You'll remember even some of the yield tours back in August were already starting to show good pod numbers. And, of course, that's what yield really comes from on soybean uh, in soybean fields, pod number per plant. So uh, the, the, the thing with soybeans is, of course, because we grow them across such a huge geography, right, across – you know, from Thunder Bay to, to Niagara Falls and, you know, the, just the whole stretch, there's there's such variability in there, right? And so it is hard to get a handle on what the whole final number will be, for sure. Um, I think we were expecting a good crop, but the other side of it is, Bernard, we just are, are slightly better, and who knows when the final number comes in, when whether we will be better than 2018, you know, which was 51.4. So it's, it's right at the top there anyway, yeah. Now, Horst, I want to add some context uh, for these yields and how they stack up with other growing regions. And, you know, you did some great numbers here. Yeah. Five-year average for Ontario now is 49 bushels per acre. Compare that to the U.S. five-year average at 50 bushels per acre and Brazil at 52 bushels per acre. You know, that's pretty impressive for Ontario. Uh, you know, it's a real horse race. Oh, I mean, I think it really speaks to the success of the soybean breeders both public and private, because we have to be honest, in a lot of Ontario, we don't have those deep soils, right? And, um, of course, you know, we can have the moisture here in Ontario, which is very important. But the fact that those short-season beans compared to a place like, you know, um, even a place like Arkansas (laughs) that has lots of heat units, the fact that we can compete and even out-yield some of those places – uh, is pretty amazing. And you think about Brazil, you know, a lot of it, of course, where the main soybean growing areas are, uh, heat un- units aren't limiting at all. And and they're not really that much further ahead of us. So it is, it is pretty exciting that soybeans have that ability. And Bernard, think about this. For the first time, uh, we had a 100 bushel average of one of the performance trials at Richtown College. So, I mean, great work to those guys down there who did that. And, uh, you know, that just speaks to the incredible potential of some of those varieties. Now, you know, plots, they're all, always a little bit higher than field averages, obviously. Um, but even up here at uh, where I do some work, north of Mitchell, we had some individual plots close to 90 bushels in 2021. And that, that's just awesome, right? Yeah, pretty incredible. Um Horse, let's talk about the season. It started dry, then it turned wet um, by late June, and the rain kept coming um, through the fall. You know, the conditions were difficult for many growers, um, but everybody got through harvest pretty much, um, and you've got some top yields. Um, You know, again, a record yield. How did you get there? Well, I think there's a, a, a bunch of things going on. One is that for many of us, we were able to plant in a reasonable time for soybeans, right? We weren't pushed into June. I mean, once you get into June, it, yield starts to drop. And of course, though it was fairly dry in, in a lot of May for some of us anyway, which is actually a good thing for soybeans because the roots grow deeper. We don't have that disease profile really setting up as much. And then of course, we did have a pretty warm year too on average. And you know, as much as we like showers, for sure, no question, those big, heavy, 
rains that we had in July actually hurt us in some ways. So, I mean, I guess really what I'm saying, Bernard, is uh, it was the weather. There you go. Uh, <laughs> the weather. But married with that really is, again, the fact that we are getting better with our varieties and we are getting better in terms of knowing how to feed soybeans and and look after them, right? Mm. Yeah, and speaking, just building on the weather there, I mean, obviously all that rain creates challenges, especially with nitrogen and uh, and and making sure we have that available to the plant. That caused some trouble. We saw a lot of yellow beans. We saw a lot of beans struggle. Talk about nitrogen this year and, uh, you know, what you learned there. It really was one of the most extreme scenarios that we've had in terms of these beans looking okay in June, right, kind of coming along. And then as we get, got into July, just turning yellow within a, a very short amount of time, corresponding with those big, heavy rains. And we had a lot of uh, talk and conversation, should we apply a little bit of in-season or a lot of in-season nitrogen to try and, and get them out of that quickly? And the, the, the simple truth of the matter is, you know, in, in the work that we did, now these were intensive uh, managed sites, so they didn't really turn yellow like this to the same extent. They turned a little bit pale, but not like extreme. And anyway, we did that where we applied our whole management package. We got about eight bushels, right? Pretty nice. If you compare that to corn, for instance, right, at a three to one ratio, obviously that would be 24, but some of us are almost at a four to one ratio. That's a pretty, pretty nice number if you can get eight bushels. Point is, you know, where we applied 200 actual of N. And so we were really just trying to massively feed those beans. We had no more extra yield, right? And so it, 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 that eight bushels did not come from the nitrogen. And, and that's really been our, our struggle with additional nitrogen. Yeah, we can get a bushel two sometimes, but uh, there's not a lot there, right? And so at the end of the day, we tracked some of those yellow fields. If the rain stopped and the conditions were more normal, they all came out of it and they were just fine, right? Mm -hmm. I want to talk about potassium, um, another you know yield robber, shall we say. And sometimes there's a lot of confusion um, with soybean cyst nematode. Um, and I, when you and when you get soybean deficient, sorry, uh, potassium deficiency and and nematodes, that's, that's a real you know sort of recipe for robbing yield. It's their horse, and uh, how do we manage it? Yeah, and, and, I, and, and you're absolutely right. It is there. And I think that's the first message we have to get across. I'm, I'm uh, surprised at where it all is. We have soybean cyst nematode right up into Bruce County, all the way across to the Quebec border. And even personally in trials this year, I got caught over at Allura, where half of the trial, you know, look, potassium deficient, was struggling, and we were standing there, and this was a fertility trial. We were standing there and saying to ourselves, you know, there's only two possibilities here. One is we had an equipment failure and the, and the fertilizer didn't get on, or the roots can't take it up, right? And so tests were done, large numbers of SCN, even up there at Laura, and I talked to, to people uh, right, right to the Quebec border who really didn't didn't even uh, have an inkling that they had soybean cyst nematode. They did some samples and big numbers. Mm -hmm. So my point is, if you see potassium deficiency, always you should check to see if you have soybean cyst nematode with a good soil test. And of course, what they do is they attack those roots and then the nutrients can't come up. And so you have what looks like potassium deficiency, but it may actually be in the soil, right? Mm -hmm. And so the reason we talk so much about potassium is, of course, because soybeans need a lot of potassium. And if we want to have these big yields, we're going to have to feed that, mm -hmm. that, that nutrient. There's no, no way around it. Yep. And then a, f a final point, uh, Horst, uh, you've got some data here on some, some potassium trials. Um, really shows the impact of, from a yield perspective, if you've got low test soils, what does this data tell us about what we should be doing and how we should be looking at our soil tests this winter? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the thing that surprised me a little bit on, on those eight trials, and we'll do some more, um, is that when 
the soil, the average number, uh, th that's the part that surprised me. The average yield number was 4.4 for a product like Aspire, which is basically potash plus a little bit of boron, right? And that number is pretty exciting because, of course, the return on investment is, is there at 4.4. And the soil test on average across those sites was not that bad. Now, to your point, though, where the soil test was in a really good place, right, we didn't have any response, zero. And where the soil test was lower and, you know, we took just the bottom half of those trials in terms of soil test the response goes up, right? It was about six six bushels. So at the end of the day, the way we should think about soil tests is basically the way we've always thought about them. There's a greater likelihood of a yield response as you get lower for both P and K. Here's the cool part, Bernard. I think, you know, we're all living in these kind of inflationary times or whatever you want to call it, and we're uncertain in terms of the fertilizer uh, return on investment, right? It's a, it's a big deal. Who are we kidding? Interestingly enough, when you compare the price ratio of what we're selling the beans for and what we're paying for fertilizer, it really hasn't changed that much. In fact, it hasn't changed at all. Um, so as long as we can sell our beans at a really good price, we should not give up on fertilizing soybeans. That's just uh, not the way to grow a successful soybean crop. Yeah. As, as long as, I mean, I think the key here is that you do a good, consistent soil test to know where you're at. Because if you're over 120 for K and over 20 for P, the uh, parts per million, you know, the, the likelihood of getting a response is much lower than if you're below those numbers. Well, Horst, hey, some, some great insights. Uh, great to look back at 2021 yeah. and uh, let's uh, connect earlier in the year we'll look at 2022 because I know you've got some more research that we need to dig into well and I, I gotta be honest with you I'm excited about 22 you know if, if we can get a hundred bushels in some of these variety trials I mean it really is exciting to know where the top end is for beans so I'm looking forward to another great year next year so nice chatting, chatting with you